Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. I want to thank one of the sponsors for today, and that is Kendra Scott. Kendra Scott has the jewelry you've been searching for with high style, quality gifts at an affordable price. They even have a great selection of gifts under $100, plus free shipping, free returns, and here's the best, free gift wrapping. Yes, I love it. Use the code HAPPYHOUR for 20% off your purchase of any full price fashion jewelry at KendraScott.com. Com, or mention the code happy hour in any Kendra Scott store. That's code happy hour at Kendra Scott.com for 20% off your purchase valid through September 1st. I have a pair of Kendra Scott earrings that I adore and love so much. I'll have to show them to you guys on Instagram, but use the code happy hour, 20% off Kendra Scott.com. Okay, friends, happy June 12th. If you're listening to this live, we are the second week of June and it is summer full swing around here. Our family went to Arkansas last week, and we spent time with Amy Hannon at her store, Una Mays. I adore her, and it was such a pleasure to hang out with her and have an event at her store. It was fun to meet listeners and readers, and it was just a great time. So happy June 12th. We have a phenomenal show for you today. The guest is Ali Casaza. I met Ali in Orange County, California when I was out there this spring. Speaking at Catalyst, she came to my hotel room. We sat down, and the only thing I knew about her— was what I see online. And she is as cute, as funky, as real, as lovely in person as she is on Instagram. Her motto is helping women simplify and focus on what matters. And I'm telling you, I spent a couple of days in the month of June already simplifying, purging, throwing out. And I would think about Ali sometimes as I was going through things in my bedroom, in my closet, and just wondering, does this matter? Do I need this? Am I holding on this for some reason? She's kind of like the Jesus-loving Marie Kondo is how I kind of think about Allie. She's living a fully decluttered life, and you're going to be so encouraged, even if you think to yourself, Jamie, I live a fully decluttered life already. Well, pat yourself on the back, and I'm proud of you. You're still going to love this show. And don't worry, we're not going to make you feel bad about any kind of clutter you might have in your world, because remember— She wants to help women focus on what matters, and that's important. Allie and her husband fell in love at Senior Prom, which is super cute. They've been married for 12 years. She runs her business to support moms in clearing the chaos in their lives. And motherhood can sometimes feel so very chaotic. She gives us some practical tips today on what we can do. We also talk about postpartum depression. We talk about where this came from in her life. And we talk about the grace that the medicine had for her in the early years after her daughter's birth. You guys, before we get to the show, I want to remind you about our newsletter. Now, our newsletter goes out every single Wednesday, and you're going to find show notes every Wednesday in it. You're going to see who the guest is for that day. You can click on the newsletter to get to information. We also send you any extra things. If I've written a blog somewhere, if I'm a guest on another podcast, if I have a YouTube show that came out, whatever it is, you're going to see it there. I also have my travel schedule on there because so many times I travel to places and I hear this from you guys. I didn't even know you were coming to fill in the blank. Well, the newsletter tells you where I'm coming. And so I would love it if you subscribe to it, jamieivy.com slash newsletter. Also, we tell our newsletter peeps about things first, which I'm about to start writing a book and I'm not going to talk about it much. I'm just telling you I'm not. I'm just going to put my head down. I'm going to write a book. But I already know I have questions and my questions are going to my newsletter friends and they're going to help me out with this. So jamieivy.com slash newsletter. All right. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Allie. Allie, welcome to the happy hour. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm glad to be in your home state with you in Southern California, Mm -hmm. which is dreamy. You live in a very dreamy area of the world. It's dreamy right now. Like is it, it not always real, dreamy? Well, it just gets really dry. It's expensive here. So sometimes it feels like you're paying for like brown desert. Like there's legit scorpions and stuff here. Yeah. So, but it's beautiful right now. Good timing. Jamie. If it makes you feel better, <laughs> we have legit scorpions in our house as well. In fact, okay. my husband is allergic to them. And we lived in our house three years and he's been to the ER twice. So <laughs> this is, this happened, this, he got stung a couple of weeks ago and it stung him <laughs> on top of his thigh. So it's kind of a fattier area uh, and it was super quick. So he was putting his pants on 
and there was a scorpion in there. He knew yeah. it immediately and he freaks out because he's, been, he's very allergic. So I'm like, I jump out of bed because he screams. I wake up my oldest kid. He comes running in and Aaron looks at me. He's like, he said, you have to calm down to me. Like I'm great in a yeah. tragedy here. Super helpful. And so we just kind of look at him. I run down, I get Benadryl and then we're just waiting. Like, do we need the EpiPen? <laughs> like literally we're, my, my son and I are just looking at him like, is he breathing? Is he breathing? And it ended up being okay. We think, cause it was like, maybe a baby scorpion, but it was on this fatty area. And before uh, he's been no. bitten, like finger, you know? We have a scorpion as a pet. No, you don't. We do, unfortunately. So it's a real scorpion. There's a real scorpion that was put up for like a contest at my church. We have a small church. And in the kids club, it's Science Sunday. Like we homeschool. I don't need any help. Okay. And they, the kid that knows the most facts about scorpions gets to win this baby. And because Emperor you homeschool, scorpion. your kids won? My daughter knows everything. She's like, I got this. And I kind of just thought this isn't really going to happen because like God is real and he loves me and cares about me. No, it happened. And she scorpions won. should not be pets. She won the scorpion and it got out the first night. No. Yep. Cat knocked over the cage, the scorpion got out and we had to turn the lights off and turn on a black light to find it because they glow in the dark. Was there any part of you that was like, baby girl, the <laughs> scorpion has gone? <laughs> I was like, I mean, a part of me that I didn't know really existed came out. I was saying things I'm not proud of. I was sitting in the bed, like quivering and yelling, just yelling, like, just get it, just get it. And then this is like the Christian version of what I was saying. For, just I, get I it. I hear you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my husband and my kids were all just searching for it. We found the scorpion, put it back in the cage and it's just there. But I'm like torn between being the mom that's like pretty relaxed and like, yeah, like I have three boys. You know, unfortunately my daughter is more the boy than any of the boys. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I, I have four boys basically. She's just such a tomboy. So I don't know what's going to happen, but we have a pet scorpion and it got out the first night. Oh my gosh. That was last week. So it's raw. Does said pet scorpion have a name? Charlie. Charlie. It's a very scorpion esque name. I don't know. I don't I don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> okay, I do have one final question, Allie, before we move on to real life. What does the scorpion eat? Crickets. Okay. So you have to go to those special stores and get crickets, yeah. Yeah, and they, and the guy has continued to ask, Oh, do you have a snake? And I'm like, No, it's worse. I have a scorpion <laughs> named Charlie. He's like, We don't get many families like you. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, they must be homeschoolers. Well, I want to tell right. you that you have won the homeschool mom of the year award right now. I'm giving it to you because you are allowing this to happen. Oh, thanks. It's worth it. Okay. Enough about Scorpion life. Tell everyone, just give us a 30 second snippet of your family and what you do in life. Yeah. So uh, I'm married to Brian. We've been married for going on 12 years. Um, we met in seventh grade. So we've been in each other's lives for a long time. And we have four kids. Um, Bella is our only girl. She's 10. And then we have Leland, who is eight. Hudson, who is uh, six. And Emmett, who is four. In the throes of motherhood. Now, you told me that you and your husband fell in love at senior prom. Yeah, we did. Were you each other's dates? That was my number one question. I was like, That's did they? hilarious. No one's ever asked. <laughs> oh, I'm that. imagining this, like is, a, this is a else. movie. Y'all both came with other people and then you, your eyes met across the dance floor and you're like, you're my love. No, it was the opposite. We went as like last resorts for each other. Okay. Just kind of like, well, we've been around each other for a long time. Like everyone else sucks. We'll just go. Yeah. And we ended up like the prom was super lame. We went to a very like elite private Christian school where no dancing was allowed. Oh, it sounds fun. It was, it was super. So we just ended up going out on the deck of this ship that it was on and just talking and kind of just realizing without everyone else around us, like we really got along and he was everything that I was wanting. And we just clicked and talked the whole night. And I went home like, that was weird. And how come I didn't realize that before? Like it's Brian. Yeah, it was weird. After that, it took him like 15 days to say, I really enjoyed myself. Let's go out to dinner, which is, I always am like, what's wrong with you? But you were in. But I was in. You were he in was on the in ship. as well, yeah. but not saying anything. Yeah. So yeah, and then everything happened from there. We got That's married a fun two story. years later. Yeah. You got married two years later. Mm-hmm. Y'all were young, young, young people. Yes, very young. Love um, it. Very young. And I feel like everything that happened there just kind of fits what happened with the rest of our lives. Like we got kind of thrown into love in our relationship and then told that I couldn't have any kids opposite happened. Anytime Brian looked at me, I would have a baby. Yeah, uh-huh. And so we got thrown into parenthood and it just was all chaos. We had to figure it out as we went. I love it. Okay. So tell us about your business as well. And then I want to ask you some questions about your family. Yeah. So my business is, 
It's my favorite thing. I get to help moms who come to me just kind of overwhelmed, heavy laden, burdened. Um, a lot of them are struggling with really heavy things like depression. And they're just in that phase that I was in myself years ago, just feeling like the things that are taking up their time are not the things that they want to be taking up their time. Like their stuff, their clutter, their, like, I guess the maintenance, like the mundane parts that are, we all have to deal with it. But when it takes over and it's stealing from the things that really matter, that's when there's like a balance problem. And so I kind of help them. I come in and I just show them like, let's clear the clutter. You in come your- into their home. I used to. Now it's all digital I'm and like, it's all I'm like, how do passive. I get you on the plane with me on Friday? Right? I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I do miss it. I do miss it so much. But there might be a TV show coming where I get to do that. We're going to talk We're about that in a minute. Oh, please come to my house. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It'll be so fun. I will air all my dirty laundry for the result to be you making magic happen. I don't happen. care what the format is. I just miss coming into people's physical homes. It was so fun. Okay. You can come to mine. Okay. I'm on it. But um, yeah, like I have a course where every, everything that I know is just kind of recorded so that it's passive, it's more affordable and people can just do it at their leisure when it works for them. But that's what I do. I come in and I just kind of clear the physical clutter, the calendar clutter, even like the heart and mental clutter, just the stuff that drags us down so that we can focus on what really matters and show up for our families and show up for creating white space for the things we want to say yes to, but kind of feel like there's so much on the task list that you, you have to say no. Literally. I would guess like 92% of the women that are listening right now are thinking to themselves, I need this in my life. I hope so. I mean, it's definitely, (laughs) I'm even sitting here thinking my husband makes fun of me and jokes that I have like three desks in our house. Like I have an office, like a a tiny house that's mine. No one else works in there. Yeah. That's my office. Then I have a desk in our bedroom Mm -hmm. that is full of stuff. And then there's a small area downstairs that he calls my third desk. And so (laughs) this is a real thing of just so much input. Now, you said, oh, I have so many questions, Allie. Look, sure. I'm, I'm going to try to not make this a personal counseling session for myself on how to declutter my it's own okay. life. You're on a couch. It will act like we're in a personal session. Now, you did say this because I want to ask you about this. You said, I wrote it down. You said the two biggest time sucks are laundry and dishes. Mm-hmm. I, there's, yep. There seems to be no solution to that, but you have one. So basically, let's talk about the dishes first because it's my favorite one. Now, how old's your oldest? 10. Let me just give, you probably aren't experiencing this, but anyone that's listening with young kids, that's one of our chores. Mm -hmm. So my least favorite thing in life maybe to do is unload a dishwasher. Amen. So I make my kids do it. Yeah. I don't do the dishes anymore. I haven't for about a year. Okay. So you have kids that do it. Okay. But tell me about how we declutter dishes. Okay. So everyone listening and you think about your dish setup. Most of us have more than one like set of dishes, even though we really only need one. Right. That's fine. If you want extras for hosting or whatever you do, you a lot of people are like, no, you know what? Like, I don't even need these. I'm going to get rid of them. And they just keep the one. Well, a lot of people have like kids dishes. You yeah, know what I mean? I remember dishes. having kids dishes, which we don't have anymore, but. Yeah. Yes. We and had 8 million plastic dishes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you know, have what you feel like you need, but we often have so many more than we need. Like it's ridiculous. Most people have four sets of dishes. That's are you what I'm serious. I yeah. That's like the average. I've seen more and I've seen. <laughs> I've seen less, but most people have four sets of dishes and they're mismatched. Like they've been broken, yeah. but you know, I'm, we put them into piles in terms of what matches and that's what it is. And so that's re- like, it's ridiculous. We don't need that. Even two, you don't need, you need one, you need one type of dish per person in your family to like have out in the regular cabinet being pulled out day to day. So for us, like we're hosters, we host things at least once a week. We're always the ones like for Bible study and yeah. people's parties, we're always the ones, but usually that's paper plates. And if it's not like I do have one extra set of white dishes that's like put in a separate cabinet for to pull out if I need it. Because what happens if somebody in your house, especially with older kids, needs a fresh dish, they're not going to rinse what's in the sink. No, of course they're not. They're gonna, they would never think to do that. Humans opt for the path of least resistance and that path is a fresh dish. So what you're telling me is if my family of six only leaves six plates in the cabinet, then the result is if you need a plate, you need to find a clean one, which means you might have to wash you one. Rinse, yeah, you wash one off. Mm-hmm. So literally all day, what we do is we've got like, you know what I mean? Like the types of dishes, like the big dinner plate, the smaller yeah, lunch uh-huh. plate, the bowl. Like we have one for each of us and like a couple spare for if somebody comes over for lunch, you know. 
And we that's what we do. There's a little dish drying rack that's super cute that I got on Amazon on the side of the sink. And we wash them off after every meal. It's like a rhythm that we've just fallen into. And yeah. we're home all the time. We work at home. We school at home. And the kids and I, mainly the kids now, wash the dishes and put them in the— And then the next meal, they're ready to go. Yeah. And it's so much simpler. At the end of the day, like, we use all the dishes. We use the pots and pans. We run the dishwasher and, you know— or normal in that way. For sure. But it does save so much time and effort. And that is how these people get these giant piles of dishes. And you're like, I only ate, we only ate here together one meal the out of the day. Full, yeah. The sink is overflowing and it's an hour and a half of washing the dishes. And you're trying to like make it joyful and like putting music on, lighting candles, but you're like, this is crap. Yeah. It, yeah, you get rid of that. It doesn't you know, necessary. You talk about how you work at home and you school at home. This makes me think of when summertime hits my house mm-hmm. and my four kids are home all day which means we eat three meals together. And I feel that's when I'm like, I don't care about the planet, paper plates it is, because it gets out of control Mm -hmm. with everybody eating at the same time. Now, what are you going to tell me about laundry? Okay, so with the laundry, I mean, it comes down to, first of all, look in your dirty pile. Because I think a lot of the time we think like whatever's in your dirty pile is what you're wearing, which is usually true. But a lot of the time, do you ever go through and you're doing the laundry and you're like, what the heck is this doing in there? I've never seen this sock. I don't even know where this hoodie came from. Like, they have it to my kids' I don't laundry remember baskets this. all the time. Yes. yes. So go through that first. Like, don't stop washing unnecessary stuff like right out the gate. Like, just go through the dirty pile and get stuff out of there. But you're like, this doesn't need to be a part of our lives. And we're not using this. I've never seen this. Yeah. And then go into your wardrobe first because you have the most control over that. And you know, like you wear 20% of it most of the time. And the rest is like, for spe- especially for what we do, like I have like speaking clothes mm-hmm. and they don't get touched yeah. unless, because I know like from that unflattering angle down there, <laughs> I look great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is only on a this stage. Is a spe- yeah, yeah, only a stage clothes. And though that's fine. Your little black dress, you know, your speaking clothes, your work clothes, that top that looks great on you, but only from here up. Uh-huh. Like, we yeah. all have those things. But, and like your mom clothes, it's fine. But if you don't have a use for it, if you really don't love it, if you don't look lighter and fitter in it. If it's not helping you, it should be doing you favors and serve you. Like you should be excited to get dressed in the morning. Yeah. Like I am excited to get, I love fashion. I don't have a capsule wardrobe. I love putting outfits together and getting dressed. So my, I have a really big closet, but every single thing in there, like I know what it's for. Yeah. I love to wear it and use it and piece it together. So go in and gut it out until you feel that way about your closet and get rid of that stuff. Because so often, like, even if it's just hanging there, it's taking up space. And if you walk into your closet and you've got some white space, it does something to your subconscious. It frees you up. And what does it do for you if you walk in and you, like, know that box over there is full of clothes that, you know, I used to be skinny before I had kids or whatever it is for you. It messes with you. Yeah. And so do you, you show them clothes. Like I, I'm, I wonder with this about women. I do this sometimes. I'm always like, I'm gonna get back into those pants. Mm-hmm. So I hold on to them. But I went through a stage a couple of years ago where I was like, I'm gonna let go of them because mm-hmm. what if I never get back into them? I'm okay with that, first of all. And then they're just sitting there, like taunting me, yelling at me every time I walk in here. Yeah. You hold on to stuff, or do you get rid of it? So I think like I just did this with a dress. I've been having these like hormonal issues where I'm like, I've been working out like crazy. Like I got a trainer and I've just been like finding my energy is higher. Like I feel so much stronger. I can plank now for like over a minute. Girl. Feel super strong. You should feel about strong about I that. I love it. But yeah. I haven't lost this, an inch. Uh-huh. And that is discouraging. It's discouraging because then you're like, why am I putting in all why the effort? Why am I even, yeah, exactly. And you know what? I got to a point where I had this dress hanging on the back of my door. So when I would go into my room for the night and shut the door, I would see the dress. And it was like, I'm speaking at this thing in June and it is my goal. It's a summer event in a very humid state that I'm not looking forward to to, you know, like ugh, all that. I'm from California. I don't do humidity. Yeah. And so, except my skin always looks amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, I'm at least like, I'm working really hard and I'm going to look amazing. And I, I, you know, it's been three and a half months and not an inch. So I started to get, instead of inspired, I started to get resentful. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the key. Like when you start to feel negative, like your inner, you feel innerly like rushed and pushed and forced and it's, negative, take it down, like get rid of it. You know, you're, if I was told right now by a doctor, you're never going to lose another pound. I would still get up and go to my training because I feel so good and so energized and strong. So what's the dress even for? Like it doesn't matter. So I moved it to the back of my closet and set an alert in my phone for two months from now that says like, let go of the dress if I'm not fitting in it. Because 
How are you going to feel in two months if you have to let go of it? You know, I really think that I really think I'll be okay. okay. Like a month ago, I would have been like, freaking out and like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Wasted money on that. Like I didn't, I don't like to not meet goals. Are you, are you familiar with the Enneagram? Yeah. Tell me, what okay, are you? I'm an eight. Okay. So I'm just super goal driven. Like I'm really driven and really goal oriented. And it is an identity issue for me if I don't meet a goal. And a month ago, I would have really had a hard time, but I really feel like I'll be okay. Like it's, it's about what's going on inside of me, not what's happening on the outside. And if for the first time, I really feel, I really feel that. It's not like something That's that good. I'm saying. That's a maturity thing too. You know, of like, you're feeling as though I am, I do see the results. Mm-hmm. They just don't look the way I thought they were going to be. Exactly. And so you're having to figure, and you're having to weigh too, do, the, do these results matter as much as I thought this result mattered? And exactly. Of getting in the dress or whatever, but exactly. you're seeing the benefits of it. Yeah. And at that point, it won't be serving me anymore. It won't be inspiring me and pushing me forward. It'll be making me feel negative about what I've done so far and actually dragging me backwards. So you have to check in with yourself about, you know, those pre-baby clothes, you know, whatever, it, while we're on the topic of laundry, whatever that is for you, check in with, is it is this a positive goal or is it a negative, like drag? you back yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So one thing that I know that you talk a lot about, which I feel like you are the Jesus loving, what's her name? Kondo? Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo. We watched some of her shows over spring break and then I made all my kids go clean out their closets. It was marvelous. Mm-hmm. I was like, everybody clean out your closets. Yeah. I'm telling you, we got rid of so much stuff. I'm like, this is great. You didn't realize what you have. No, you <laughs> didn't realize what you have. But one of the things that I've heard you speak about over the past couple of months, which I'm also a member of your newsletter list and you do great content. So oh, great job there. Uh, but I've seen you talk about not only does this living this unclutter life physically clear up clutter in your home, but you've talked about the emotional and mental aspects of it, mm-hmm. feeling a, living a fully decluttered life emotionally and spiritually and mentally. Can you tell me what that has done for you and for pe- women that you've helped? What do you see the benefits of that? We're taking this these practical steps of decluttering our home, mm-hmm. but then we end up actually feeling decluttered on a spiritual level and emotional level. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, how can you not have it spill over? It's like when, for me and my story is like, I saw the results of this physical clutter. I saw it transforming. I mean, my time, like how I was as a mother, how I was as a wife, our nights went from me kind of like, cause we had a reverse role back in the day where Brian went to work and I was at home and now it's the opposite. And I would be like, can you help? Like I would, you know, angry and resentful and like naggy, like super just stereotype, like that whole thing. uh And it went from that to like, I had freedom to watch the office with him and relax and and enjoy my evenings and my weekends instead of like catching up. Um, And so when you see that result, how can you not like ask that question? Like, how could this affect my calendar? And how could this affect my walk with the Lord and my relationships? And you kind of just feel the freedom to like, I'm gonna let go of that toxic person. Like you just kind of feel, like it's worth it and you know that it's going to work out. And so I've seen a lot of people do things like they declutter their house and they think that that's it. But then they're like, I started a blog because like I had all this time and what do I do with this time? I'm going to do my passion. Or they had another baby that they never thought they'd be able to handle. They were kind of telling themselves like, I can't handle a third baby. And these like little lives are being born because they were freed up or their marriage was saved. They were really struggling and like on their way to divorce and things cleared up just because like she was lighter and, and she showed up differently because because she didn't have so much yeah. pushing on her. So I think it's really important. Did you start, a lot of my listeners are moms, not all of my listeners are moms, obviously, but did this start to become kind of necessary for in your life when you became a mom? And there are these added responsibilities of humans that need to eat and play and nap and all the things. Is that when you started to feel as though things are a little bit out of control? Yes, it was for, so for me, this all happened when I had had my third baby. So like I mentioned before, we had been told like, you guys are going to struggle with infertility. Like, good luck. That was basically what we were told. And come to find out, like it wasn't that way, but we needed to either decide like, do you want to struggle with infertility later? Or do you want to like bust it out and get these babies had? (laughs) Yeah. We were like, okay, let's do this. So we had three under three. And here I was like in this in this joyful existence that I didn't think I was gonna have. And I was miserable. Like I was resentful. I would wake up every morning. Like I remember my eyes would open and I would just feel like, 
I don't even have an ounce of the energy I need to even get through this morning, like let alone the whole day. Like all I did was maintain. I was like shooing the kids away from me to catch up. And I'm not a neat freak by any means, but it was like, you know, you have to keep your house away from CPS status, right? Right, right, like, yeah. So it was like that. It just was so much. And, you know, my babies, they were a lot. Like I just, it was a lot. It was a very busy, full time. And I wasn't, I knew that I was called to abundant life. I knew that this couldn't be what motherhood was supposed to be. It felt like there was extra, but I didn't know where it was. And God showed me it's, it's your stuff. Look at what you're doing day to day. And so when I let that go and I cleared that clutter, I just couldn't, I could not believe how much more time there was. So it kind of became like this survival mode game in motherhood for sure. But I see guys taking me up on this and doing this and changing those single guys, you know, single women, parents and singles alike, you know, just doing this and finding so many benefits. I think it's for everybody. But for me, it was like a, I got to get through this and not only get through it, but I want to thrive in it and not, have motherhood be this like, like those memes, like, mm -hmm. you know, good moms have sticky floors and happy kids or whatever. Like you've got to yeah. choose, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, I didn't want that. I didn't want to barely get by. I didn't want to have to choose between like loving where I spent my days and enjoying my kids. Yeah. And I was just kind of determined to find a way. And that was it. It was the stuff. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question. I think some moms are thinking as they're listening to you because I've had lots of kids at a young age and yeah. plenty of listeners have the three kids under three. I was just talking to a girlfriend of mine today and she's like, I'm like trying to survive three under three. And you're, you wake up to the scenario of something has to change. Like I am, I'm not thriving in motherhood. And for mm -hmm. you, you looked around and said, I need to fix some things in my home. Here's what I hear people asking. It's hard enough Parent, this is what you don't know too before you have kids. You think, how hard can it be to just take care of kids? You just give them some food and let them play outside and it's a day, right? Right. But all of us who have been through the motherhood journey or you have been a nanny or you had a sister or you have a neighbor know that it's not that easy. Where did you find the time and the energy to do that in the mm -hmm. midst of three under three? So I think- a lot of the time I get this question and it, and it's funny because- So I'm not the only one wondering this? No, like this is one of the top three. Oh, I, I can't wait. After this, tell me the other two. Okay, yeah. Or maybe see if I ask them and then I see if I do my job well. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's funny because I think it might be a personality thing because it was shocking to me when I started to get that question, like, what do you mean? But when I would dive into it and like do surveys or ask people, people have, women, moms have this mentality that you can't get anything important done with your kids around. And like, look at what you do with your kids around. Like you can shower with the baby and the bouncy and the toddler watching Dora and Netflix. And like, you can cook, you can, you know, run a business with your kids underfoot. But then when it comes to decluttering, you're like, whoa, how am I going to do Wait this? A second. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of funny that I've seen that mentality shift. And I think a lot of it has to do with like that subconscious procrastinating. Like this isn't really something that I want to do. So like, well, I can't do that with my kids at home. Yeah. Even though I do a million other amazing things, like I'm a friggin' warrior and I do all these things with my kids underfoot, like this one, like, no. I think it's a little bit of that because every time somebody has truly like come to me with this problem, like I can't get it done with my kids. It's like, you do so many other things. Like you don't really want to make time for this. And I think you've got to create that drive. You've got to understand the science behind this stuff and like how much it matters to give you the drive to make it happen and make time for it. But also my kids were so little and I just did it with them right there. Like mm -hmm. I would just get the baby busy or wear the baby and have the toddlers help me, which took twice as long, but for sure. it's okay. Kids just want to be with you. So if you're going to sit on the floor and purge all the papers you've got in your office, you know, just let them sit on your lap. Let them be there with you. Do it during their nap time if you absolutely cannot. If you really want something, like when I was starting my business, I woke up at four in the morning for a year and worked for four and a half hours before Brian went to work. If you really want something, like you make it happen. Yeah. And I knew, like I... I had personally had this moment with God where he, I was waiting for some philosophical response and he just showed me, look at what you're doing with your days. So I knew this would work. So I showed up for that and I, I put it on my calendar like it mattered. Yeah. Like Mondays and Saturday mornings were for gutting out my closets and my kitchen cabinets and, you know, checking in with what the kids actually played with and getting rid of the rest. Like that was my time. 
and until it was done. And then, you know, moving forward, it's maintenance mode and you're, you're done with the initial purge, but this is your lifestyle, like eating healthy. So Allie, I'm going to need you to come to my house and hold my hand because even <laughs> when you said purge the pantry, do you know what people would find in their pantry? If you purge your pantry, you will find stuff that I expired four years ago. Yeah. You know what else I need to purge? As you're sitting here talking, I'm like thinking about all the things. Medicine. You know, you have the cabinet that has all the medicine. I was looking for something mm-hmm. the other day and I found a medicine bottle. I didn't even know who, who it was for, what it was for. We hadn't lived in the street for like four years and expired like forever ago. I'm like, why is this still in why my cabinet? Why is that there? Why is yeah. this still in my cabinet? Ours is, yeah, ours is that, like old prescriptions and vitamins. Yes. Like especially because I think vitamin supplements are so expensive. You're oh, like- we're going to get every penny out of this. We are going- <laughs> And honestly, yeah. how bad can it be if it expired? It's vitamins. Come on, just take it, kids. Just, You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but yeah, it's stuff like that. And I mean, that's the kind of stuff too, but it's like people think that it just doesn't matter. Everybody has this. And it's it does matter though. Like it's cluttering your your life. And then when you get into your kitchen and you're trying to find something and you open up, you know, the cabinet and like we keep all of our vitamins in the kitchen and all of our medicine in the bathroom. So if I'm in the kitchen and I'm looking for a spice, like the vitamins are right up there. If it's a total crapshoot in there, like you can't I feel find it. that. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. And it's like I already don't like to cook very much. Like, can my kitchen at least be like a right. peaceful oasis? Yes. You know, it's like you want to be the places that are purged. And it's so funny because every single time, like I, so in my course, I have it laid out to where you start in the bathroom. It's an easy yes or no. You okay. can get that momentum. And so the women, like every time they email me, like this is going to sound so weird. Like I've never heard it before. And they all say the same thing. Like I started in the bathroom and I had my coffee in there this morning because it was so cleaned <laughs> out. Like I just wanted to spend time in there. That's awesome. And it's true. Like, and now imagine if your whole house felt like that. We just did a little, like I told you, we've done this mini spring break kind of breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Well, we went through our spices. Yes. It's always humbling. (laughs) It is so humbling. And we cook, I say we, my husband cooks a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of just like random spices, but we went and got unified little from Ikea, like these spice jars. And then I got out my little, my friend Amy's in here too. What did you give me? A label maker. I got out my label maker. And we put all the bottles in there. And so now they all look alike. It's so easy to find. I mean, it was the best thing. Isn't it weird? Like it's the smallest the thing. smallest thing. And you're, yeah, I'm not the one that does the cooking either. My husband's like basically a chef and he can cook anything yeah. and everything. But like, he's even like, I feel better being in here. Like yeah. I'm excited. And we found out we don't need to buy chili powder for a really long time. So we're good on Same. that. <laughs> yeah, and turmeric. And turmeric, yeah. <laughs> because you use like none ever. Yeah, we're good. Okay, friends, I'm going to break up this conversation for just a second because I want to thank two of the sponsors of today's show because they make the show happen. And I'm actually a fan of both of them. So the first sponsor I want to thank is Molecule. Guys, imagine if your phone, the thing that we have in our hands 24-7, imagine if your phone was the same as it was in the 1940s. Well, that is exactly when the technology that you are using to clean your air was developed with the invention of the HEPA filter. Thankfully, guys... Molecule has introduced a breakthrough science that is finally capable of destroying air pollutants at a molecular level. Now that sounds very scientific, but here's what you need to know. Nothing had been done since 1940. Molecule came in and developed breakthrough science that is actually killing air pollutants at a molecule level. Molecule's PECO technology goes beyond HEPA filtration. It captures and completely destroys the full spectrum of indoor air pollutants, including those 1,000 smaller than what a HEPA filter can catch. In fact, you guys, in a study of 49 allergy sufferers presented at the American College of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology, Molecule's technology provided statistically significant symptom reduction within a week of use. One customer even said she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. That makes me so happy. And Molecule doesn't just have groundbreaking technology on the inside. It creates a complete and clean air purification experience from the materials used on the device, like its sleek, solid aluminum shell, to a streamlined filter subscription with replacement filters arriving at your doorstep right when you need them. Erin and I have our molecule in our bedroom and we can tell a 
big difference this past spring when allergy season hit here in Austin. It did not affect us like it always has. Molecules technology has been personally effective and verified by science, but most importantly, it's been tested by real people like me. I just told you I have one. Molecule has already helped allergy and asthma sufferers around the country better cope with their conditions and significantly reduce their symptoms. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule. That's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com and enter the code Jamie. That's me at checkout. Molecule, the air you were meant to breathe is finally here. And I want to thank our next sponsor, and that is Butcher Box. Every month, Butcher Box delivers 100% grass fed and grass finished beef, free range organic chicken, heritage bread pork, and wild Alaskan salmon directly to your door. And you guys, please listen to what I'm about to tell you because let me tell you something. You need to know this. This month, here it comes. I need like a drum roll or something. Butcher Box is offering free bacon for life. I cannot even believe what I'm reading. Their bacon is sourced from heritage bread pigs and is uncured, nitrate-free, and sugar-free. Did y'all hear me? I said bacon for life. Butcher box meats come from humanely raised, open pasture animals that are never fed antibiotics, hormones, or fatty fillers. And it's affordable, you guys. By purchasing direct from a collective of ranches, Butcher Box can buy meat at a lower cost and pass those savings along to you. Choose from curated boxes, including a mix of high quality beef, chicken, and pork, or customize your own box so that you can get exactly what you love. Each box comes with at least nine to 11 pounds of meat, which is enough for 24 individual sized meals. You know what, guys? I say it all the time. If you can deliver something to my door, I'm a happy, happy mama. And if you can deliver food to my door, I'm a super happy mama. And if that food is good meat that I know it has never been fed antibiotics, hormones, or fatty fillers, I am in. We've had a butcher box, and it was so worth the investment of great meat being delivered straight to my door. You can tell when meat is quality and when it's not, and butcher box has quality meat. To receive $20 off your first box and a package of free bacon in every box for the life of your subscription, go to butcherbox.com slash happy hour. Did you guys hear what I just said? Free bacon in every box for the life of your subscription. Go to butcherbox.com slash happy hour or enter code happy hour at checkout. This is a limited time offer. So go now to butcherbox.com slash happy hour, promo code happy hour. Get yourself some free bacon, people. Okay, now here comes the rest of the show with Allie. Okay, I want to switch gears for just a little bit. Yeah. And um, you actually didn't mention this to me in my little email that I sent out to guests beforehand. But I know I saw that you just released a podcast about it. So I feel comfortable asking you about it. Yeah. You just released a podcast talking about postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering if we can talk about that for a yeah. little bit. And you mentioned um, in your podcast that you you experienced this after your first daughter. Mm-hmm. And I know now if I'm sitting here chatting with you that you had three kids really quickly. Yeah. And so let's talk about what that season was like for you, how you worked through it and what that looks like now. Yeah, absolutely. Anything. I mean, this is so important. And I I saw, like we're similar in that, that we kind of talk about all the things. And it's a little bit of like a life journey that we're sharing here. So it's been mentioned a few times. And I knew that it was kind of common just from the responses that I would get. But when I kind of, it felt like a coming out of sorts. Like just like I not only struggle with this, but like, it was really bad. The worst I've heard of so far. Mm. And just getting real with how bad it was and the emotions that I lacked for my daughter that are normal. It was really eye-opening to see how many women struggle with that at that level. Mm. And so I just realized like, we need to just keep talking about yeah, this. Yeah, I think there's some parts of like depression and mental illness and mental health that can be scary because we feel like this then makes us a failure. Mm-hmm. Like I can't give this to my kid. I can't be what I'm supposed to be as a mom. And then there's this other thing for, especially for us as women is, I mean, for me, there were many things about motherhood that I didn't know were going to happen, mm-hmm. but this could be so alarming to someone because if none of, if no one's talking about it like you are, which I'm so grateful that you are, people could start to experience this and have no clue what it is and then not yeah. understand the science behind it and that they're not alone and that they can get help. So- Right. I mean, thanks for talking about it, basically. Sure. So walk through us with when you diag- when were you diagnosed with that and what did it actually look like after you had your first little girl? So I mentioned in the episode that I had substance abuse in my family. So my mother 
comes from, I mean, her mom legitimately dumped her off at her grandmother's house and left. So she was abandoned with her sister who was two years older. Um, And then my grandmother, her mom has just substance abuse. I mean, that woman did every drug known to mankind. This is your grandmother. My grandmother, Mm -hmm. she's passed now due to all the drugs. But like my grandmother and my grandfather, like just, and then her mother, like just up the line, my mom broke the chains. And she doesn't realize like how amazing she is for doing that. But like, she's the only one that stopped. Yeah. And then she dealt with a lot of like emotional, mm-hmm. just unhealthy emotions from her past. But she's the one that broke the chains. Which you can look back now and be like, mom, you your chain breaking affected generations. Yeah, absolutely. My mom, my mom really tried and reached out to me despite all of her emotional issues because of her parents and because of my grandmother's had her issue because of her mother. Like it just kept yeah, going. Uh-huh. As far as we know, there's mother daughter issues. And so my mom will often say things like she did it. Oh, like, oh, I wish I would have been better. And I'm like, uh, you're amazing. You broke so many chains and that have allowed me to break more. So anyway, I knew about all of that. And when I found out that Bella even existed in my, in my womb, I was shocked. I, I thought we're not, this isn't happening for us. Like we'll deal with this later. We're so young. Who cares? And there she was. And the reason that I was vomiting at the beach in my at my birthday party. And so I was I was shocked. Then finding out she was a girl, I immediately had a wall up. Like I just, I don't know. I immediately felt like, oh boy, like we're gonna have to work through some stuff, you know, she and I. And because of your past. Yeah, I yeah. just knew, like I had just watched it wasn't even a conversation my mom had had with me. I just saw it and I don't know. I've always had a really strong, like spiritual awareness, even as a child. And, you know, I've talked to the Holy Spirit my entire life. And so I just knew like, this is going to get real. And then when she was born, I don't know. I just felt, I'm glad you're out of me because that was rough, (laughs) but I didn't feel what I felt with my sons and what I knew you were supposed to feel. I didn't know that yet because she was my first, but I, I knew you were supposed to feel something. I just felt like this wall up. And so I had like a panic attack um, on the table. I had a C-section, emergency section. She wouldn't nurse. So like our whole relationship was just started off by like frustration and disappointment. Like disappointment in myself for not being able to give birth. Like that was a big thing I had to work through. Frustration with her. Like you can't even nurse. Like it sounds, Come on. Sounds yeah, sad you just got silly. here, yeah. But yeah, it was just like, man, like we just can't catch a break and it's been 48 hours. Like it was rough. My healing was awful. They left my stitches in. I had an infection. We just couldn't catch our breath. And at this point, does Brian understand what you might be, do you even know what you might be feeling might be off? Or do you think, Mm -hmm. I guess this is how it is? I'm thinking, I guess this is how it is. Side note, I think I suck at this. Okay. <laughs> um, and Brian, like, we're Which so is a young. Emotion. We're like 21 years old. Y'all are babies. Yeah. yeah. Like, we were still just shocked this was even happening because mm-hmm. we were just told, like, you are really going to have a hard time. Yeah. And so, anyway, you know, I didn't get diagnosed with postpartum depression until like 10 months into it because I refused to go to the doctor because I was afraid of doctors. I had had a terrible one for my delivery. I still struggle like with doctors. I just don't trust them. I have such a hard time. And that was the start of all that. So I just felt like I went to one appointment and I was basically told like, suck it up, buttercup. And I mean, just my, I mean, again, going back to being an eight, like I just kind of had this like, okay, like I can be tough, you know, and I just plowed through and I suffered for months and months and months unnecessarily. The second I got okay, I want to ask you another question mm-hmm, in the midst sure. of this, because I think this is something that women would want to know. Yeah. What made you go to the doctor? Because from what little I know with postpartum depression and just depression in general, sometimes it's difficult to take that first step. Mm-hmm to go seek out help. You don't was have it Brian, your normal drive. Or was it, what, what made you say, I think I'm going to seek help? It was the peaches incident that I mentioned in the episode where I was feeding Bella and she must have been about eight months old. Um, and then I remember it took a while for me to actually get in, but it, she was around that age. I was feeding her baby food and she was just being silly and like spitting raspberries at me, like, you know, pounding the table, like making a mess. And I 
we were living with my parents. Like we had lost our apartment because my husband got laid off. It's just all of this yeah, stuff was stuff, piling yeah. on. So I'm sitting at, at the table and my mom is folding laundry right across the room in the living room. And I just could feel her watching me. And I, of course, took it as like, she's watching me because everyone if I can knows do there's this. something wrong. Yeah. And so I'm feeding her and she's just being overly silly, making a mess. And at one point I just lost it. And I was like, like basically like shoving the spoon in her mouth and like, like angry. And my mom came over and just very sweetly like, oh, here, let me, let me help. And I like slammed the peaches down. They hit the roof and peaches went everywhere. And I was like, don't you think I can do this? Like, I mean, like veins bulging. I remember my throat aching from how loud I yelled, like just not myself at all. And seeing Brian's face and seeing her face, seeing Bella's face. And just like, I remember all the thoughts rushing through my head of like all the times that she had cried and I just didn't, it was like, oh, just stop. Like I didn't feel that mother connection. And it just hit me like there is something so wrong. And I don't want there to be anything wrong, but I realized that there really was. And I think everybody in the room did because later that night, they all came in my room where I was laying in bed, which is where I basically lived for a year. And just said like, what can we do? Like, we don't want to make you feel awful, but like we want to help. And we kind of all just discussed it and I made an appointment. And so like a month or two later, of course, it takes forever. I got in and honestly, I think that I got to the doctor just before it took a really bad turn Mm -hmm. because I was starting to have thoughts like that are not healthy. Like it would be better if I was just gone. It'd be better if I wasn't here. Like not necessarily suicidal, but just like, what if I just left? Yeah, yeah. And it would just be better for her if we just stopped this. And I had just found out that I had this weird like 0.001% of extreme fertility with the uh, female disorder that I have. And so I'm thinking about other babies and like, well, great. Like I'm not even fit to have her. Like now, you know, he's going to look at me and I'm going to get pregnant. And like these kids are going to be screwed up. Like I should just go. So it was really, really dark. And I I got on medicine just kind of begrudgingly. Like, I guess I'm just like, you know, so bad at this that I have to be medicated to be normal. Like that's your thought process. But then as soon as the medicine kicked in, like it increased my serotonin, it balanced me out. And I felt like my, I, I think everyone thinks when you get on an antidepressant, you get robotic. It was not that way at all. And it's such a lie, such a lie from the enemy to keep you from getting well. It's like being diabetic and not taking insulin. Mm -hmm. Like it balanced me out. I finally felt like myself. I started reading again. Like I'm such a bookworm and I just didn't want to read. I didn't want to walk. I would take these long walks before I got pregnant with Bella. I started to want to walk. I started to walk with her. And she would like kind of just babble and do her little like baby toddler talk. And we, that kind of built our relationship. Like I got back to myself and that was when I got well. And I was only on the medicine for a year. And then I was able to wean off and never go back on it again. Sometimes you just need a line thrown to you to get your brain back to where it needs to be. Like it was really an imbalance that needed medication. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I've I've shared the story publicly before, but when my last child came home from Haiti, it just kind of uproared our home a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a hard experience for a child to walk through and a family, all the things. Absolutely. And I had some situational stuff and was on medicine for a couple months. It changed. It helped me so much. Mm-hmm. And I love talking about it. I don't talk about it that much because it was. It feels like a really long time ago, but I love having conversations with women about it because especially in the church, there can be such a stigma yeah. around yeah. Um, medicine. And it's exactly what you just said about if you had cancer, you would get chemo. If you, had, if you were diabetic, you would take insulin. And we live in a broken world and God has some common grace in medicine that can help our brains when they are not functioning right. Mm-hmm. So I know that you sharing this on your public platform, I don't know that it's scary or hard, but I do know that it will help a lot of women. Absolutely. So thanks for doing that. So you um, you start to feel more like yourself. Bella is 10 months old and you've told us she had three babies. Did you struggle with this again? So after Hudson, so he's my third baby. So Leland was born and I felt great. And I was so overjoyed. I don't know, you know, I've never gotten like medical backup on this, but- I really think that, first of all, the extra estrogen from having Bella, I don't know. I felt weird. Like I had skin issues. I had like 
cystic chest breakouts. Like that baby did a number uh-huh. on me. And she's the only one that I really had PPD with. And also like the generational thing, I really believe that there was just a spiritual attack on our relationship. And people have been messaging me saying like, loved this episode, even though I don't really think that that's, you know, yeah. you know how people like yeah. backhand mm-hmm. compliment you. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> loved this, but hated it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get those often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I know that that's what it was and it doesn't really matter why, but I know that that's, that's what was going on and it's been broken. Um, And so with the boys, I really didn't struggle much. After Hudson was born, I kind of felt just like baby blues, I think. Like I realize what people are talking about when they say that. Because I always wondered like, is this baby blues? Like, dang, this is Which is hard for people to understand. (laughs) If you've never had a child, you just can think- this must be normal, but nobody told me how hard it would Where's be. Where's the line between yeah. like baby Where blues and I kind of want to like jump off a bridge or yeah, something. Exactly. Like what the heck? Yeah. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. And so with Hudson- and I think the line can be so blurry sometimes. Absolutely. Which is why it's great when women talk about it and you can say to your girlfriends, this is what I'm feeling. Is this normal? And they can say, yeah. yes, or no, the I think you need some here. help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just kind of felt like down, like just like, do you know when you just kind of get in like a low mood for a little bit and you're just kind of need, need some space? I kind of mm-hmm. felt like that. Like I was just super introverty and just like, I just needed to soak up my baby. Um, We were going through a lot at that time. We moved and like there was a job switch and I just needed space. It was not like Bella where it was like, I don't feel anything when you cry. I don't really want you to be here right now. It was really bad. But other than that, like everything was smooth sailing and the boys were very easy. I attached to them right away. But I will say that it was a bad feeling to have Leland and Hudson and still not feel full circle with Bella. Like that brought up a whole nother, like opened up a whole nother door of just like, now I've got these two boys and I feel this immediately, but I'm still working on this with Bella. Um, And I shared in the episode that, you know, she's 10 now. And just in the last two years, I mean, it's like all the way gone. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been prayerful and just really walking this road and really intentional with it. And it's taken all of this time. So I don't want that to be discouraging. I actually want it to be encouraging that even if it feels like, man, it's just been all this time, like there's so much to be won still. And it it might just take some time, but she's my girl. She's my girl all the way through, no matter how old she gets. So yeah. it's okay if it took, took some time. Yeah. And now we are where we are. And it's like, it's amazing. And I think because I've been chasing her so long and chasing those emotions, she feels very loved. Like I'll ask her about stuff and she'll she'll say like, yeah, I, I definitely remember this or I felt that and we can be open about it. And she knows our story. She listens to the episode with me. And so she knows and she's just like, wow, like that's amazing. Like God is so amazing. So she knows the power of the story that she was a part of before she even realized yeah. it. But yeah, I think I think that it can be a story of hope if you let it, even though it took so long. And I I- I almost didn't want to say how long it took, you know? Mm -hmm. Because maybe you felt like, oh, I wish this didn't take this long. I wish it was like a year or, Uh you know, less. But man, like to say like, well, she's 10 now. And in the last couple of years, it just sounds like, oh my gosh. But if you're feeling that, like I got messages from women that are like, my son is seven. Thank you for telling me your daughter's age because I still feel like we're working on this. And it is disruptive to have postpartum depression and not have that connection with your baby. It is very disruptive. So it's okay if it takes you, you're missing something that is innate, like God gave us to attach and you missed it. So it's okay if it takes you extra, extra, extra long to get that, to form that. Yeah. I think it's a good conversation to have too. And it can be a scary conversation because again, it feels as moms, like I must be failing at something because this yep. is not how it's supposed to be. But your situation is not alone. I mean, I come from the world of adoptive parenting. And that's very common in adoptive families. I mean, I have friends who have kids with special needs and that is a Mm -hmm. whole nother ball game of feeling as though this is just not how I thought this was gonna play out. And so this feels more difficult than I think it was supposed to feel. And so there is this feeling that you're, you're, you're explaining here, which is so good, is, you know, pushing forward and still chasing that even when it's hard. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Okay, before we wrap up, I do need, you alluded to something earlier and I've already volunteered my my life to be on display. Are you gonna have a TV show? So I and think I know I'm what allowed you're gonna to say. share this. This is what you're gonna say. You're like, <laughs> I can't tell you anything. I, well, I don't know. Just do They're it. They're weird. Okay. What's the worst thing they could do? 
yeah, cancel it's, you. <laughs> it's fine. So we're in contract with a production company right now. And this is the th- our third rodeo with this step. And I've backed out the other two because- You backed out or they backed I out? I backed out. Okay. Because it was weird and sleazy. They wanted it to be like a reality show about my family. And I mean, I don't know. Maybe we're super interesting and I don't realize it. But <laughs> people like, they they switch gears and they want to make it about that. And they this production company is amazing. They want it to be about my business and what I do for women, which is what I want. And they're we're pursuing a show with, you know, I don't, maybe HGTV, somebody, somebody else. I don't know. But, you know, it might not happen. There's walls that we're hitting and stuff. You know how so it is. So this is how it works. Remind me, because I think this is true. You work with a production company. They mm-hmm. film a few episodes and then they pitch it to networks. Am I yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we've been planning all the filming, doing all of that, and like just kind of waiting on the back end of what exactly is this going to look like? Like they, they're like, okay, like what, who's going to be in it of your family? Jamie like Ivey. who's not? Yeah. Jamie Ivey and uh-huh. Alex Saza. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and so it's just, I don't know. It's, well, that's fun. Know. It's exciting. Yeah. It's all, it's all weird and like shady and like, I don't really know. They're like, they're, you know how it is. Like do you have they, a lawyer? They do this. I do. Okay. Good. A really good one. Okay, good. I feel I better. I love him. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's all like, they do this all the time, so they act like it's normal. But and you have all these you're questions. You're like yeah. wanting to know what's going on, uh-huh. but you don't want to be annoying. Mm-hmm. So I'm super unannoying. I don't ask anything. Like if they call, they call. If I feel like I'm like a girl on like a date and like trying to be cool and like play by the rules. You're like, hey, I'm cool. You're about my third. You're definitely my third, maybe more. Well, I've had other people on the show that have been on shows, but you're like my third person that in the past, this year, 2000, well, in the past six months I've interviewed that is in the works of producing a show. Oh man. It's crazy too that that would be happening still so much because I feel like things are just moving away yeah. from traditional, I don't know, yeah. publication. You know, the Gaines are having their new production. Uh, I mean, their new I network. I saw that. Maybe that they'll pitch you there, I know, right? That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll um, see. Yeah, okay. So for, first of all, did you ever imagine that you were going to declutter your home and start a business? No. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> this is what I was telling someone that day. It's 2019. Literally, you can dream up something and you can make a career. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean it's literally, I look at you and you're like, I had all these kids and I just looked around and I felt overwhelmed and I decluttered my home and now you run a business. Yeah. And you support your family. Oh, Yeah. Because and other families yes. now, which is so cool. Which yeah. I just love. I mean, I look back now and I'm like, gosh, 15 years ago, podcasting wasn't even a thing, yeah. you know, and now it's a job for me. It's so cool. I know. And it's like the new blogging, like everybody's everybody's got a podcast now, and it's so crazy how things just shift and you can just hop on board yeah, and, I know. and do what you want to do. So basically, what we're saying to you, listener, is if you have a dream, you can do it. Do it. And I hate to, like, I have to say this since we're talking about it. I hate to when people say like, well, so-and-so's already doing it. Uh-uh, or, I do know, too. No. Nope. Yeah. Go do it. No. Here's that what I say lie. to that. I say this all the time. They're not saying it with your voice. Yeah. And there is nothing new under the sun. I know we can say like podcasting's new for sure, but there is no new idea. Anything you or I do that we're going to produce, mm-hmm. we're not the first person to think about it. There's always someone else doing it differently. No. At the same time as my story was forming, Marie Kondo's was forming. How do you think I felt like five years in when like she came out with her book like before I was already doing this? Yes. But she was just further ahead and uh-huh. bigger. Uh-huh. I could have stopped. Oh, I'm I could have stopped right before everything went viral for me, you know, and nothing, none of this would have happened. So you can't, you can't do that. You can't think that. You got to keep going and be your own voice. I love that. People will come to me. I have a good friend who started a podcast recently and she's like, I didn't want to tell you because like you already do a podcast. And I was like, girl, there's enough room for everybody to do a like podcast. Like you're the only one that's allowed in I'm the friend like, circle exactly, to be a podcast. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, no, how can I help you? Let, I'll cheer you on. So yeah. I'm a big believer in um, there. the scarcity mentality has got to die, that there is yeah. enough room for everybody and you can chase your dream and do it in your voice and you will find your people. Absolutely. Yeah. Mic drop. Okay, <laughs> Allie, before you go, I always ask my guests three things are loving and what you're reading. So what do you have for me? Okay, what I'm loving is, I think I put this on my little form that I filled out with you. I've been doing these things called gratitude walks like every day. And it's amazing. Like uh, I don't have a set time where I do it, but like when I'm just starting to feel like I'm overworked or I'm frustrated with what I'm working on or the kids are driving me crazy, like whatever it is, I'll just stop. And because I live in California, I can just take a walk (laughs) no matter what month it is and just get outside and just, 
it's a, it's like basically you walk and I just literally out loud if I'm with one of my kids, not out loud if I'm not, cause then I look crazy. Yeah. Like what am I grateful for? And it's so cheesy sounding, but it is life changing. Like it changes your mindset for what you had to get away from. Absolutely. And sometimes it leads into like, I'll start saying what I'm thankful for, but it usually leads into more like, I'm like straight up speaking scripture or affirmations to myself. Just like, I do not need to stay stuck there. Like, that is not my story. Like, I'll start, like, pep talking myself. You're preaching to yourself. daughter's walking with yeah. me, like, mom. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> okay, gratitude walks. Love gratitude it. Gratitude walks. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, what else are you loving these days? Okay, so there's these, it's so random. It's a thing. So I'm anti-minimalist right now. But there's these little, like, shops on Etsy that make these, like, stone rings. It's so random, but I've been like obsessively (laughs) buying these like Aztec rings and like turquoise, like these little stone, like they wrap around and they're super flattering and fun. I've been like randomly obsessing with accessories lately. So like I'm wearing one today. It's just plain silver, but is that from the Etsy store? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's just cool. Like support small. I love supporting small businesses and they're fun. And like it dresses up like a plain outfit. So that's my thing. Oh, I've been reading People to be Loved by Preston, Preston Sprinkle. Sprinkle. Uh-huh. <sighs> needed. It's so needed and so good. I'm I'm just, I love his voice and what he has to say. I do too. And he actually has been sprinkling in things about women in his talk about like homosexuality and people and the church and all that. And it's just been really life-giving for me as I've been on a journey since I started my business with being a woman in the Christian circle, being the breadwinner, being like, I'm so much personality wise stronger than my husband. And I've always felt that like, shh. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And so I don't know that book has, I don't think that's what he meant, but, but you're getting that out of He's it. thrown in a few things yeah. and it's just really like mouth stop and like, wow, I really saw that up. Jesus feminist. I'm uh-huh. rereading that right yeah. now. Sarah Bessie. Sarah Bessie. So good. Um, What's your husband's Enneagram number? Two. Okay. So basically reverse <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. of like gender stereotypes. And we struggled for so long with that. And who are we? And why isn't this working when we're stuffing ourselves into each other's roles? Yeah. So yeah. that'll do it. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay. So everyone that's listening, we'll put the links in the show notes about where you can find everything. But if someone is, and I know that they are, they're like, I need, I need Allie in my life. Go to your webpage. <laughs> Yeah, just alikasaza.com. You okay. can like pick your own adventure there. You can. I've signed up for some of the adventures, so I hear you sometimes. <laughs> I think I got an email from you. I mean, we all know that you're not writing them in that moment. That's how it works, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think I got one from you today. Yeah, you probably did. I probably New did. episode. I know, yeah. So, <laughs> Allie, thanks for sitting down for the happy hour. Yeah, thank you for having me. Support for today's show comes from the Life is Good Ping podcast. Join co-founders of Life is Good, Bert and John Jacobs, as they talk to influential musicians, athletes, business leaders, and everyday people about the role of optimism in their lives. They'll also end each episode with a ping pong charity challenge where the winner gets to donate to the charity of choice. The Life is Good Ping podcast kicks off Thursday, June 13th with legendary Ringo Starr. Subscribe now on Stitcher, Spotify, or iTunes and add some good vibes to your day. Okay, friends, I hope you loved Allie as much as I did. I'm so thankful for the conversation that she opened up with us about postpartum depression. I know that is a hard conversation for women to have, and I'm thankful for her leading the way and talking about it in a way that doesn't make it feel awkward or shameful. But she talks about her real experience and how God met her where she was and the common grace of medicine, which helped her. Thank you, Allie, for going there and talking about that. Also, I'm grateful for her support of women to clear the clutter in our lives, to help us live more intentional with our people. I think that is something that I'm longing for in my life right now. And this conversation was so good for me. I cannot wait to put to practice what I'm learning from her to clear out my three desk in my house. You guys, what is happening? Today's show is edited by Chris with Podshaper and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Show notes are written by Aki Slockers and the whole thing is organized by Lindsay Sweeney. You guys, next week, my guest is someone that I have been dying to interview for years upon years upon years. No lie. When I started this show and I thought, man, who are some like top five guests I'd want to have on the show? Um, There were several people that made it in that list, more than even five, if I'm going to be honest. But one of them was Elizabeth Hasselbeck. I've adored her from afar forever. I've respected her um, as an individual, as a follower of Jesus, and as a journalist when she spent time on The View and Fox and Friends. So 
couple weeks ago, I sat down with Elizabeth when I was in Nashville, and I was a ball of nerves, you guys, but I played it cool. You wouldn't even have known, and we had just such a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed my time with her. Okay, you guys, enjoy your week. Enjoy summer, whatever it looks like for you. Share the show with a girlfriend. Go have a happy hour with a friend, and I will see you all back here next week with my friend, Elizabeth Hasselbeck. 